Hey, it's Mike here, and today, does this new keto report prove that super high LDL does not cause atherosclerosis on a keto diet? We're talking about the preliminary results from the lean mass hyper responder study where people on a keto diet get super high LDL. I mentioned it briefly in the past, but the results are having people who are on a keto diet, low carb, carnivore diet, whatever, shouting from the rooftops about the findings, with a lot of people now feeling that it's okay to chug endless amounts of saturated fat and increase your LDL to 500 because it's not gonna do any damage. And speaking of shouting from the rooftops, here is Sean Baker, carnivore dieter, telling his following to share these results far and wide. So the data that I've been talking about is finally in. It's this super exciting stuff, something I think is incredibly, incredibly powerful. You know, this particular set of population, low carb, lean, otherwise metabolically healthy, that it appears that cardiovascular disease is not developing or not developing at any significant rate at all. So that may give some of you guys that are in this situation some level of relief. As you can see, all of his carnivore commenters who have high LDL rejoiced. They're totally fine. Except this one wondering when the weeks of diarrhea will stop. Make it stop. I know some keto dieters will watch this and be like, oh my God, this guy's vegan. Let's just see what stupid stuff he has to say about this. But no, a lot of the criticisms that I'm gonna be levying here are by people that are not vegan. You know, they're people that are even more or less in the same camp of low carb. For example, more or less a whistleblower that helped author the study initially, but was then later kicked out over their concerns. Yup, it's gonna get juicy. And I will say, I want to present lean mass hyperresponder as a concept in a fair way because I I believe that people on a vegan keto diet, despite even potentially eating lower saturated fat, metabolically could end up in the same situation. So we should know about it. All right, let's go starting out with the basics of lean mass hyperresponders for those that aren't aware. If we call it LMHR, that's what I'm referring to. And this term was originally coined by low carb dieter, Dave Feldman. And this really refers to leaner people, people with a lower BMI that when they go on a keto diet, their LDL skyrockets. And they actually now have some particular figures for this. They say an LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter, HDL over 80 and triglycerides under 70. And many of these people have an LDL between 500 or 1000 milligrams per deciliter. And again, the conventional cutoff is 100 for increased risk. Well, saturated fat certainly plays a role here. It appears that you know, we can see people playing with their saturated fat intake and not making much of a difference with their already super high LDL. So in that sense, somebody who is more lean has less fat mass who is a vegan going on a vegan keto diet might be able to get there as well. And the question is, why does this happen? And they have developed a whole theory that has to do with the lipid metabolism of these people, which we'll touch on later on in the video. But first, I do just wanna thank the YouTube channel Plant Chompers, Chris in particular, for highlighting this whole LMHR thing and then interviewing the researchers. But let's just get right into the basics of the report. I say report because you know, we're talking about a presentation on the baseline data from a study that has not been peer reviewed, hasn't been released. And the baseline data was presented by one of the researchers, Dr. Budoff, who is a preventative cardiologist. And just looking at this study, we can see that we've got people who are average age of 55 and average time of keto dieting at 4.7 years. They got 80 people that are keto dieters and then they matched them to 80 people in the Miami Heart Study. You know, sort of a loose match, but they tried to do the best they could. And the results that have everybody jumping out their seat is that these keto dieters with the higher LDL don't have a statistically significant higher amount of plaque in their arteries compared to the control. And there was no difference between these two groups. As a matter of fact, the area under the curve was identical. Okay, now this is where it's time to unleash some criticism, which is probably gonna make some people kind of annoyed, but the truth is that the keto community in general is just putting this out completely in a positive light from what I've seen. So it's my job as somebody who's not invested in that diet tribe to say, here is what's wrong with it. First of all, there's several problems with the way they matched these groups. First of all, they didn't match things like physical activity or BMI. The BMI is statistically significant so that the control group averages overweight and the lean keto people don't. And of course, we're gonna talk a lot about the time scale of the study, but first let's touch on that physical activity matching completely lacking here. And the Miami Heart Study did have this exercise data and they could have easily gotten it from the LMHR people, so sketchy. It's very likely that we have a healthy user bias here. I mean, keto and CrossFit, two 
sides of the same coin here. And of course, being less sedentary and having exercise is going to decrease the amount of plaque that they likely had, especially their whole life before that four years. Multiple studies show that even just sitting more is associated with increased plaque from this one. Those bars represent stenosis. More sitting, more stenosis or blockage of the artery. And then this one out of Dallas says, quote, each hour of sedentary time was associated with a 14% increase in coronary artery calcium. Again, they didn't match for physical activity. Next, we have BMI, which I think is especially damning when you consider this statistically significant BMI difference from like 22 and a half to 26, which again, averages overweight. You know, heavier people are likely to have been heavier for longer and, you know, for all sorts of reason, have a larger atherosclerotic burden, again, before those 4.7 years, but also currently. That brings me to this study, which was done on people approximately 60 years old, so quite comparable to that 55-year-old average in the LMHR study. Well, looking to this chart, we can see BMI and plaque burden is very well linked. And while it is dwarfed by people in the obesity areas, you know, we can see on this chart where each group would land. If we zoom in, it is the case that the people in the control group's BMI would have about twice the amount of plaque as the people at the BMI where the LMHRs are, are, are. So if you were to say adjust the LMHR plaque numbers to include BMI, all of a sudden we'd probably be looking at a completely different picture. And yes, well, increased BMI means just more calories and things that could increase atherosclerosis that way. It of course means you're likely to have more visceral fat, which is directly inflammatory and can increase heart disease risk. But now let's get into what I believe are the biggest flaws of all. And that comes from our whistleblower. Let's just call him a whistleblower, Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, who claims to have had a major role in the original study design before before things were changed up a bit. And why did they want him on there? You know, maybe it's because he has some renown as the medical director at Weight Watchers. He went to Twitter and tweeted like 20 things, but for the reason that he was kicked out, he said, quote, so my biggest gripe is that this is being used to promote that LDLC is not harmful. In fact, it was the reason I went to the IRB, essentially the studies ethical review board, well, to express my concerns and was kicked out of the study. But it's not just about what the data is being used to do. He said that there were actual problems with the study. First of all, that they kicked out people who had a coronary artery calcium score greater than zero. To quote, one of the biggest goofs in the beginning was excluding those with a history of atherosclerosis. We did this for safety purposes, of course, because it wouldn't be ethical to have those with cardiovascular disease to continue to have a 190 and higher LDL. Because of this, a handful of young subjects were excluded due to having positive CAC scores. This is super whack because they obviously could have gotten clogged arteries on their keto diet. So they're finding the people that did get that and then just like excluding them from the study and being like, look, their plaque isn't higher. And to my knowledge, the exclusion criteria for the control group was not as stringent. Feel free to correct me. But then being younger reminds me of this 2022 case report of two carnivore dieters aged like 28 and 33 who had that super high LDL. You know, these are young men, likely lean though it doesn't say. And the plaque in their arteries were 90th and 97th percentile, meaning super high. Despite it being very possible that they got advanced atherosclerosis from their carnivore diet, they would be excluded you know, for ethical purposes, which blows my mind because it's like people who largely believe that LDL isn't doing any damage are excluding the ones with heart disease because it's ethical. The second huge point that Spencer makes is that their original intentions for the study in terms of timeline and LDL cutoff was just not met. They wanted people who had LDL up around 400 because in familial hypercholesterolemia or genetically high severe cholesterol, you have plaque accumulating over say five years, which is what they thought they could get. Says with that, Dave and him thought that they would need about a five year study for plaque incidents to occur. But I guess they couldn't find enough people. So they chose a cutoff of like 190 or half of that LDL, which you know, of course is gonna take longer to occur. We'll talk about it in a second. And then butt off the guy doing the CTs, the guy who was presenting said that one year is enough. That's like a standard. And this is where it's really key to dive into the data briefly on familial hypercholesterolemia. You know, the basic definition here, we're talking about a genetic disorder caused by a defect on chromosome 19. And that defect makes the body unable to remove LDL cholesterol from the blood, which results in high levels. And we have to keep in mind that FH, we'll call it, is a spectrum. We've got what we will call standard FH with 190 or higher LDL. That's like one in 250 people. And that's heterozygous. They get one gene from one parent. But then we have what we'll call severe FH, which is you know, 
over 400 LDL. It's one in a quarter million people, and that's where you get both of the genes from both your parents. Again, they originally wanted to use that 400, but they settled for the 190 cutoff in the study. Well, from this review that also used a 190 cutoff, forget seeing any disease at 10 years. They say coronary atherosclerosis may start to develop on an average age of 23 to 34 in men and women with familial hypercholesterolemia. Don't get me wrong, that is still horrible, but it buys you a ton of time to make their diet look really good because if you select for people who have no artery buildup, you know, it could be decades until they start seeing any, even with familial hypocholesterolemia, which we need to emphasize how dangerous it is to have. From the same study, the risk of developing coronary artery disease in these people is 13 fold higher than the general population. Obviously horrible. You know, that standard FH is also really bad in terms of mortality from this study. Risk of cardiovascular events and death in the general population with FH was about three times as much. And while they didn't use that cutoff, it's also worth looking at that severe FH of over 400 LDL and some data on that. From this study, we're talking about seven times the risk of major adverse cardiac events. And that's compared to people with that standard FH. And then I have this next study, which is a bit of a tangent. It's a randomized control trial on two people. Let's just look at it as a case study. We have two children, essentially 12 and 16 years old with severe FH. They basically scanned their arteries, found some plaque, and then blasted them with LDL lowering medication and scanned them again. And get this, total plaque volumes were reduced by 76% and 85% after six months of these medications respectively. Anyway, I thought that was an amazing case of plaque volume literally shrinking. But moving on again to Spencer's gripes, he says, quote, remember it was already known that those with no baseline plaque would not develop plaque quickly enough for this study to show anything. And that looking for incidence of plaque is different from progression of plaque. So yeah, the main point here is that people with this cutoff of LDL take decades to show coronary artery disease. Now, and to shift the perspective a little bit, imagine if we had some gene therapy that gave people familial hypercholesterolemia of 190 or over, and then we just looked at people who you know, didn't have any coronary artery calcium for five years, would that be considered proof that LDL does not cause heart disease? Absolutely not. And it's just wild, the burden of proof that is put on proving that LDL causes heart disease. And we're talking Mendelian randomized control trials and the works, and then you come in with a baseline measurement with coronary artery calcium excluded, and people are like, oh, LDL doesn't cause heart disease in keto people. But I wanna be fair here and address one of the claims by the authors that LMHR high LDL is different from familial hypercholesterolemia. They're saying despite this still being LDL, that is really high, still having the same arteries, the same anatomy, you know, it's, it's magically invincible. Okay, I'm exaggerating. But they do say that the lipid profile is more favorable in these LMHR people. You know, they've got that high HDL, which should be protective, and they've got those low triglycerides, which should also be protective. But let's look around here. First of all, HDL is not causally linked to lowering risk. It appears to just be a side effect, people with lower risk, and we've seen that through, again, randomized genetic studies showing that people with higher HDL don't have lower risk, and then also medication boosting HDL, not lowering risk, cross out HDL, and then triglycerides, the benefit here could be massively overstated. Looking at this study, looking at Framingham data on coronary artery disease and triglycerides, the you know, the group with triglycerides at 50 is under 70 like the LMHR people, but has a meager difference from the 100 group, which is a more normal number. You know, maybe 0.8 risk versus 1.1, uh, not invincible there at all. And the biggest thing here that's not explained is why the LDL itself would magically be different and not cause heart disease. Yeah, they say, oh, there's more large fluffy. I've been over that argument tons of times from this chart. The risk is very comparable. That brings us to the main mechanism that's not addressed and that this LDL, especially in higher amounts, can oxidize and of course penetrate the artery wall, cause lesions, do damage. Now, keto people seem to think that they're magically in the clear here because, you know, they're not having massive blood sugar spikes from eating tons of sugar. But newsflash, uh, high blood sugar is not the only thing that oxidizes LDL and keto people don't escape those anyway. 
anyway, always. First of all, there are things that are meat specific that increase oxidization of LDL, or at least the risk of it. First of all, we've got heme iron itself from that red meat. Now from this study, findings indicate that a high heme iron intake, particularly in normal weight individuals, so lean mass high responders, may increase the risk of stroke. They say that heme iron can promote oxidative stress leading to subsequent cell apoptosis or programmed cell death. High doses of iron may lead to increased peroxidization of lipids and protein modification and DNA damage. You know why red meat is a carcinogen in the first place, but then of course we have those heterocyclic amines from cooking meat, which yes, carnivores are doing all the time. From this paper, these compounds can cause oxidation of lipids, proteins, and DNA, resulting in oxidative stress cell damage, blah, blah, blah. And the study was in people showing that a higher intake of heterocyclic amines was resulting in a higher oxidative stress level in the blood, which they say is increasing the risk of chronic diseases such as cancer and cardiovascular disease. Another fun one, trans fats can oxidize LDL, it seems. And, you know, despite being all seed oils are evil, they're naturally naturally getting trans fat from animal fat. For example, just eating a ribeye steak can get you four grams and a stick of butter, which I'm sure some of these people are eating in a day, also four grams. And I'm sorry for the mouse study for multiple reasons, but this one fed mice about 5% of their diet as trans fats, and it doubled the amount of oxidized LDL. And yeah, animal fat lands in at two to 5% trans fat, so relevant. And heck, if you're trying to get 85% of your calories from animal fat, you're going to be eating a lot of cholesterol. And guess what? Probably a lot of oxidized cholesterol as well, which studies show is absorbed in the diet to the bloodstream. Well, again, this is just a mouse study. Give mice a tiny fraction of their diet as oxidized LDL and their number of artery lesions doubles. There's also other things that can oxidize LDL. I mean, aging, probably a whole video on that. But then there's also just how infections can do it and the immune system data is not looking great for people on a low carb diet i mean from this bmj study people on a low carb diet had like four times the risk of moderate to severe covid as people on plant-based diets and of course various antioxidants are shown to lower the amount of oxidized ldl and a lot of these people are choosing to eat no antioxidants but perhaps most ironically a lot of people who are eating a ketogenic diet can end up eating you know too much protein ha <laughs> look at that too much and through gluconeogenesis and up creating sugar and getting higher blood sugar levels. I mean, Dr. Berg, not a vegan, has an entire video on this. But who tends to have the highest level of blood sugar of anybody? Well, people who are diabetic. Well, this study looked at oxidized LDL and various biomarkers, comparing things like type two diabetes and how correlated it is, as well as high cholesterol. And guess what? Hyperlipidemia, that high cholesterol was the most associated with oxidized LDL of any of the factors, including type two diabetes. And of course, these lean mass hyper responders qualify as hyperlipidemic. So in terms of this overall idea of being okay, with having high LDL, I have to insert a moderately crappy analogy here. And that is that sort of like life is a boat and you're just going through life and there's water and the water might have some sharks in it. And your LDL level could be viewed as the amount of sharks that are in the water. Oh, 70 sounds a lot better than 250. And the risk here is you, know, you might fall in the water at some point. At some point, you might get some oxidized LDL from some issue and you don't wanna have more sharks in the water. You don't have higher LDL. And to further the analogy, not eating pretty much any antioxidants in your diet is kind of like just taking the guardrails off the decks of the boat so that you can fall in more easily. I mean, this whole thing is just no. Anyway, next up, we have the funding aspect of this. And this is a case where they're saying it is crowdfunded. Therefore, it's super neutral. It's not like there's some corporation or something doing that. I have no conflicts of interest with uh, with anything related to this. And uh, the funding was, has been provided by a, a citizen science foundation, more of a, a crowdfunding organization. But... To that, I have to say, is the funding neutral? I mean, we're talking about the low carb keto community here getting together and paying for this study, hoping for particular results, paying people who are low carb dieters largely to do this study. And I can't imagine them feeling this way about a study that vegans funded to have vegans do a study on. Like, no. You know, to look at this pessimistically, their continued support for this research to drag it out to five, 10 years, et cetera, is directly dependent on how satisfied 
satisfied this group of people that voraciously want LDL to be absolutely okay are. Are they happy? More money. Anyway, real quick, let's talk about perhaps why these LMHR people end up with high LDL. They've coined what they call the lipid energy model. You know, I might have deemed it the LDL overload model, but anyway. What's the proposed mechanism? Well, we know that in lean, metabolically healthy subjects, carbohydrate restriction will lead to uh, a, a glycogen depletion in the liver. And we think that that leads to a lipoprotein lipase mediated turnover, which increases LDL. So yeah, I don't think there is a full answer on why, why this is occurring, but it does just seem that for whatever reason, people with lower amount of fat on their body are more reliant on sending energy throughout their body in the form of LDL. There you go. And I know we're getting a little bit long here, but perhaps the biggest issue goes back to the beginning here is the messaging that is coming along with this research. That is what Spencer said is bad. We have, heck, even a particular letter to the editor that was published all about this from their previous work. They say perhaps an unintended message could be that astronomical changes in LDL cholesterol can be safe in the context of low triglycerides and high HDL. This message could lead to harm. So while none of the authors are outright saying, oh, we're disproving the lipid hypothesis, heck, even Budoff on his Twitter says it doesn't disprove it. A lot of the low carb community is kind of using this data as a dog whistle to say, you know, you're on a low carb diet, you don't need to worry about LDL at all, even though by their own belief system, them. They're just talking about a small subset of that population, which I think is really sketchy. And to emphasize how delusional people are about being in that subset, Spencer says a lot of people thought they were LMHRs, but most failed the screening. In the end, I do fear that this report is really enough for people who like to eat meat or on a low carb diet, even vaguely to go, LDL is completely fine. I'm never gonna worry about it. And people need to do more work to prevent that from happening because that will result in more <laughs> disease and death. And that's assuming that this LMHR data is even valid. And I've shown several reasons as to why you should doubt that. First of all, we have those basic differences in like BMI, the fact that we likely have differences in physical activity. We've got the issue of the coronary artery calcium score of zero people being discluded from the study, as Spencer mentioned. And then of course we have that timeline issue, the cutoff of 190. We might expect people to be able to go 10, 20, 30 years without seeing atherosclerosis. So they're gonna keep milking this. And that's despite those people with familial hypercholesterolemia having a much, much higher risk of death and heart disease. And again, I don't see a compelling difference between people with LMHR, high LDL, and people with FH. You know, that LDL is still there, it can still oxidize. The HDL and low triglycerides aren't gonna save anything from that. So in terms of wondering when people will stop claiming that LDL is not causal to atherosclerosis based on low quality data, I would ask, when will the diarrhea stop? When's it gonna stop? Three weeks, four weeks? All right, let me know down below what you think. If there's anything I missed, this video is long enough, so just feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.